Welcome to Up and Up. This is a show created by the LTV intern team to highlight the work of local artists and creative entrepreneurs. I'm Scarlett Lavin. I go to East Hampton High School. I'm a singer-songwriter, and I also intern here at LTV. Today's episode of Up and Up is an LTV and Bay Street Theater collaboration where we chat with the interns for 2022 Bay Street Theater. Today, we have Bay Street's directing associate, Cameron King, here with us. Hey, <laughs> how's it going? Thank you for being here. Oh my god, it's such a pleasure. Great to meet you and you great to see the whole team. It's a great <laughs> operation you've got going on. So tell me a little bit about yourself. I grew up um, you know, in the early 2000s seeing a lot of Broadway shows and going to LaGuardia High School. Was given a lot of culture from a super young age and because of that and because of my amazing artistic parents, I caught the theater bug super early and ever since then I've had a pretty, pretty determined trajectory toward working professionally in the theater and I'm just the beginnings of my professional career. So what's your role at Bay Street? Uh, as the directing associate, I assist and help out with all of the main stage productions that are happening. So they bring in uh, teams from out in New York with professional directors and once they get to Sag Harbor, I join the team, give my artistic opinion, but mostly I'm there as a support and a liaison to help those new teams kind of facilitate with the with the theater. So tell me about your own show. Yeah, so uh, it's called Indian Summer. It's by Gregory S. Moss. Um, it was at Playwrights Horizons back in like 2015. My dad and I saw it, classic uh, father-daughter outing between the two of us, and really fell in love with the way that um, they portrayed young love and um, really loved the, the sleepy summer town that the play took place in and held on to those two things as I continued through my career. And when Bay Street told me that I would get the opportunity to choose my own play, this show immediately came to mind because of, because of many things, but mostly because it takes place in a, in a Rhode Island summer beach town um, with a lot of nostalgia and a lot of um, you know respect for the mom and pop stores. Just thinking about the patronage at Bay Street and the actors at which I'd have the, the, that I would have at my disposal, I knew that this play would be would be perfect. What do your responsibilities look like at Bay Street? Facilitating the director's process while they're here. Um, so you know that can be anything from saying that light cue looks a little bit off and if I was directing the show, here's my humble and personal opinion on how maybe we could fix it, to getting coffee for a tired man in the morning. Oh and, no. You know, <laughs> yeah, and just making sure that everybody's happy and comfortable and that the total operation is working well. Tell us about your background in the arts. What did you do before Bay Street? Sure. Um, I, I went to LaGuardia High School, and so I uh, was an actor for a long time, and like I said, just was brought up kind of in the general culture of the theater world and the theater industry. Um, so was acting and um, found myself sort of, I don't know, uh, lacking control in, in my life um, and in the way that I, I loved theater, but I knew that there was something more that I could contribute other than just my face and my body and my voice. I loved theater, and I loved theater more than I loved seeing myself in it, um, and more so wanted to see and bolster the talents of those around me. So what different types of projects do you direct? So I'm really drawn to uh, telling stories through music, and I denied this for a long time in my Carnegie Mellon career just because it's not in vogue there, but I want to direct musicals. Um, and I want to direct big, high spectacle, big budget musicals, 42nd Street, Mamma Mia, a lot of Sondheim stuff I've fallen in love with. Um, because really musical theater was my first love and the way that I kind of got into this. Um, so that's what I connect to the most is, is telling a story through music. But what that means practically is that sure, there are musicals, but I also love to add music to plays and I also love to direct music videos and really finding ways to um, creatively use my, my talent and interest in that sort of musical genre. How is the process for directing different types of art unique to each one? I can speak generally and say that directing a music video is obviously a lot more um, thinking about the, the shot list and thinking about uh, the details of, of each frame and versus directing a musical where you have to think about choreography and a music director and it's more of a group collaboration versus a play where it's a lot of intellectual table work and figuring out the subtext of the moment. Um, but all of those require everything, if that makes sense. That, you know, sometimes we 
put a magnifying glass on a certain aspect of the storytelling per medium. But uh, you know, it's it's really I, I change my process based on the cast, based on the timeline, based on the designers that I'm working with, and try to adapt my process to um, tell the story specifically in the most coherent way possible. How do you approach directing musicals? I start by listening to the music. <laughs> um, I'm actually, I've got a, a, a musical coming up, it's called Lizzie. It's the Lizzie Borden musical, and I've been hired to direct that in Oklahoma City at the end of the summer. Um, and the way I started with that one is I started listening to the music and really just hunkering down and picturing what the musician is trying to say through the choice of rhythm and notes and harmonies, you know, instrumentation. And so it starts there because I think that there's really something guttural and um, visceral about what music can bring up. And usually that is a great clue as to what the book writer is really trying to say or what the lighting designer should really emphasize. So the core of the story with musicals is music, period. When you're going to cast people, what type of research do you have to do to make sure you're casting the right people? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I'm at a point in my career where I'm doing a mix of a few things. I am working on projects where I'm getting video submissions from all across the country and all I need to do is kind of clear my mind, take my brain out, wash it, put it back in, and go into um, kind of this introduction of meeting a new person with as little connotation or as little um, prerequisite uh, thought as possible. And so there's a, there's a demand in me to just be able to take in someone as they are. I'm also at a point in my career where I am calling on favors and I am asking friends to come in and I ask the question of, you know, who, who is an actor boy that I know whose muscles are big enough to play this jock or whose uh, personality is strong enough to tell these jokes and who would be willing to kind of put their professionalism aside and do their friend a favor. Um, and so it's, it's kind of a, a psychologically strange point in my career where I'm constantly flipping between I'm, you know, directing a project that's very in vogue and people are trying to be there and trying to get into my room, which is flattering and amazing. And that process of casting is a lot more about filtering than the other process of casting, which is more about outreach and more about sacrifice and more about compromise. Um, so I, I'd say that the two projects I'm directing this summer, one of which is Indian Summer and one of which is Lizzie, are really living on, on opposite ends of the spectrum there. Oh. Um, and I'm learning a lot through that. What's your favorite part about directing? Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> I mean, I can tell you, I can tell you my favorite moment um, in the rehearsal process. It's the sits probe. The sits probe is the moment where the all of the work that we've been doing in the rehearsal studio, things that have sounded thinner or have been marked or have um, been more of a representation of what could happen uh, in rehearsal, meets with the band for the first time. So it's the point at which we go from just the music director plunking out tracks at the keyboard to finally this full sound. And of course there's you know the, the emotion that comes with music entering the project that you've been picturing for so long. But what that represents is, is the thing that I really love about directing, which is collaboration. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you know, we as a rehearsal room team got to build something but it only, you know, that ladder only reaches so far because we need the rest of the rungs that are provided by the music director and the orchestrations and all of the instruments to really get us to build to the destination and that kind of group goal of putting on a show. I love being the middle spoke of the wheel and, and facilitating communication and collaboration between artists that are much smarter and more talented than me, <laughs> but I get the opportunity to, um, to combine their work, which is really fulfilling. How has your acting experience helped you direct? I think I would consider myself a, an actor's director. You have directors that uh, come from a place of design, you have directors that come from a place of writing or even stage management, and because of that, their eye is just trained in different ways. Um, so my eye is trained as a director who <laughs> formerly was an actor. And, and something that I like to say to my actors um, first day of rehearsal because I, I truly believe this, is that there is no one who could know the characters better than the actors, because the characters are living inside of the actors' bodies, and 
I'm, I'm not, you know? And so I direct from a place of questioning, of probing. I say, you know, what do you think your character's feeling at this point? And if I suggest something that doesn't feel right, I'm wrong. And you can tell me I'm wrong because that character is living in you and is, is being formed through your experience and your history and your past. And so I think it's, uh, it has created sort of a reverence for the art of acting in, in my rehearsal room. What's your favorite show you've just ever done or your favorite project oh you've ever goodness. done? Um, the first thing that comes to mind is a show that I did at the very beginning of the pandemic, actually. It was June of 2020, uh, and it came out of a group of friends that sat around every week on Zoom um, and just questioned what theater was now, um, sort of a think tank that was started by my friend Rachel Kolb. And there were four people, and we would talk about plays and talk about rehearsal rooms and theater is something that is so rigid and so structured. It's been around since the beginning of time and suddenly our whole world collapsed and changed and we needed a medium to talk about it and through talking about it we decided to try something. Um, so we ended up doing a play called Arlington by Enda Walsh. It was published in 2016 and it's about a girl who is trapped in sort of this mystery room. You're not sure why she can't leave, you're not sure what she's missing on the outside, but through monologues and through a relationship that she has with um, an, a disembodied voice, you see this prisoner grow to freedom. We did it all entirely virtually, but it was live. And so we um, collaborated and rehearsed and took methods that we knew from a traditional rehearsal room and kind of morphed and changed it into what the times demanded. Um, and it not only became a project that I'm really proud of, but it was a really um, therapeutic and necessary way to spend my time at, at that point in my life. And I think that the others that I worked with would agree. And I learned so much about, um, like I was saying, like actor autonomy and what it means when an actor, you can't can't help them. You're in you're in another time zone. You're in another zip code, and you can't move the couch for them. You can't help adjust a light. You can't costume them or rip a label off. It's all in their hands, and so it was um, it was a really incredible thing to watch people take autonomy over their performance in a way that is impossible in a regular theatrical environment. Um, and yeah, we just, we got, we really involved so many people from around the country and across the world. And it became a, a community effort to try to solve the question of what is theater and, and what shouldn't be theater? How can we fix this thing and how can we change it? And what can we learn from the world taking the ability to do this away from us? Hmm. What's your dream show to work on? Susan Cole's Musical is my dream show to work on <laughs> because, um, you know, like I've been saying, the core of my relationship to what I do is my parents and growing up in New York City. And Susical was uh, a, mu a musical on Broadway in 2001. I was three and four years old at the time. I went to the show and fell in love with it. It's, it's a silly little Dr. Seuss the musical. It's got beautiful music and an interesting book and they had a great cast at the time, but it was kind of a flop and it was kind of a, a nonsense thing that Broadway forgot about, but to me, that show changed my life. <laughs> we saw it 11 times and I really, yeah, I grew obsessed with it. And since then, yeah, like I said, it's, it's sort of a nonsense thing that got lost in time, but I would love to bring it back and inject my own unique passion and love for what that thing did for me in terms of my whole career. So it's your training in theater. I, I joined some clubs and groups when I was back at that uh, tiny all-girls school. I actually started a junior ITS branch. ITS stands for International Thespian Society. When I was in middle school, I saw that the high schoolers had a, basically a drama club, but it's recognized nationally, sort of like a, a Girl Scout troop or something like that that has a, a, a number. So you can go to festivals or you can compete more organized. I saw a niche that needed to be filled. So I began a junior ITS branch when I was in seventh or eighth grade, um, started a drama club there, went off to LaGuardia and was given a very rigorous education um, through acting and, and just what to do uh, in terms of how to handle myself in a much more structured professional environment. Then 
uh, while I was there, I was simultaneously spending my summers at Stage Door Manor, <laughs> which is a training facility, it's a theater camp um, for, for nerdy kids around the country, and I was doing shows there, so I was really working year-round, ended up at Michigan, then Carnegie Mellon, and uh, I also spent a summer, which I'd love to mention, at the, at the Muni, which is a massive outdoor musical theater venue in St. Louis, Missouri. I spent the summer of 2019 there. They do seven musicals a summer. They have 11,000 seats in their theater, and they do shows with casts of 75 people plus. That was really my first exposure into the professional world, and it was not only professional, but it was summer stock, it was regional, and it was it was like the, the Guinness World record holder for like the most extreme <laughs> extreme theatrical endeavor I could have done I it's like you know instead of your first tattoo being like a tiny little piece on your wrist it was like getting a full face tattoo just to oh, no. <laughs> jump into the deep end in every way shape and form and I was exhausted by the end of that summer but I learned so much about the rigor and the challenge and um, really the the emotional stamina that it takes to be to be a professional in the theater industry. So I thank the Muni for so much, and that, that theater really is the most um, prestigious that I've ever had the opportunity to work at. So, so what characteristics should someone have if they want to be a director? Hmm. Uh, I think, you know, a natural-born leader. I think passion for the craft and the art, communication, um, empathy, and the ability to to liaison between different personalities um, and be able to create, like I said, a, a safe space that can feel right for an array of different people. How is directing at Bay Street different than other places you've directed? Every theater is unique in its own way and I think that for um, a summer stock like this or for a regional house like this, it really all has to do with the artistic director. So Scott Schwartz is the artistic director at Bay Street and his style is um, very loyal, he's very gentle, um, and so there's sort of a sense of um, trickle-down community from him. He really values um, this town of Sag Harbor, he really loves being out east in the Hamptons, he um, puts the patrons first and very much makes sure that they are comfortable when they come into our space. Um, versus someone like Mike Isaacson, who is the artistic director at the Muni. He operates with gentleness and passion as well, but his style is much more hands-on and much more rigorous, and he's there in the rehearsal room every day making sure that his creative vision and what he was picturing when he commissioned this piece is present in the show. Yeah, I think Bay Street, um, there's a little bit more autonomy. There's a little bit more of a... Uh, this is a playground rather than a, a school project, if that makes sense. Um, and Scott creates a very gentle, passive environment. So what do you have planned after the summer? Uh, I'm going to return to New York City and continue freelancing. I work with a theater company called uh, the National Yiddish Theater Folksbina, which just did Harmony by Barry Manilow. So I work with them in more of a, uh, an administrative managerial place. Uh, so I'll be deciding ticket prices and figuring out access codes and seat configuration, dynamic pricing, things like that for the folks we know in the fall. Mm -hmm. Do you have a website or anything we could find you at? I do, yeah. CameronAKing.org, you'll find uh, ways to contact me, my resume, a lot of a portfolio of my work, general pictures and clips from music videos that I've directed. <laughs> Looks like morning in your eyes But the clock's held 9.15 for hours Sunrise, sunrise Couldn't tempt us if it tried But the afternoon's already come and gone And I said, ooh What's your Instagram? C-M-R-N underscore K-N-G. It's my name without the vowels. Cameron underscore King. That's me.
<laughs> okay, thank you so much for okay. being here today. It was thank lovely you. meeting you. Yeah, it was great. Thanks so much.